Have you ever wondered where the word assassin comes from? You're about to discover the truth. It all started with the Hashishin, an ancient cult of killers who stalked their prey in the shadows, rumored to use hashish to steal their nerves. But what really drove them to commit such precise, terrifying murders? You'll find out as you explore the dark origins of the word assassin and the real story behind it. Chapter 1 The Birth of a Secret Sect The 11th century was an era of profound unrest, where the ancient world trembled beneath the weight of religious and political strife. The vast Islamic empire, once unified, had splintered into rival factions, each vying for power over the hearts, minds, and lands of the faithful. The Abbasid Caliphate, once the undisputed center of Islamic authority, was a shell of its former self, holding on to power through fragile alliances and shifting sands of loyalty. To the west, the Fatimid Caliphate, a Shia regime based in Egypt, openly challenged the Abbasid Sunni rule, spreading its influence from Cairo with an almost messianic fervor. Meanwhile, the Seljuk Turks, fierce and ambitious, emerged as a new power, ruthlessly carving out their own empire across Persia and beyond, all the while claiming to protect the Abbasids while secretly undermining them. It was in this crucible of bloodshed, deceit, and religious tension that a new force quietly emerged, one that would come to be known only in whispers and legend. Far from the corridors of caliphs and sultans, in the rugged mountains of Persia, a secretive figure began his rise to power. His name was Hassan i Saba, a man whose very existence would send shockwaves across the Islamic world and beyond. His story is one of intellect, ambition, and cold, calculated violence, but to understand Hassan, one must first understand the world that made him. Born in the city of Qam in 1050, Hassan was raised in a household steeped in Islamic scholarship. His father, a devout Shia Muslim, ensured that Hassan was educated in both religious and secular matters from a young age. But it was not the mainstream teachings of the Abbasid-imposed Sunni orthodoxy that captured Hassan's interest. No, he was drawn to the hidden esoteric knowledge of the Ismaili Shia sect, a radical offshoot that believed in a divinely appointed leader, the Imam, who was the only one capable of interpreting the true hidden meaning of the Quran. This belief in a secret spiritual authority outside of the caliphs was heresy to many, but to Hassan, it was the truth that burned like fire in his soul. Driven by his thirst for deeper knowledge, Hassan traveled to Cairo, the beating heart of the Fatimid Empire, and a place where the Ismaili faith flourished openly. Cairo was a city of contradictions. Opulent palaces and bustling markets masked an undercurrent of political intrigue and violence. Here, the Fatimid Caliphate, ruled by the Imam Caliph al-Mustansir, held sway. Yet even within this supposedly unified city, divisions ran deep. Hassan soon found himself immersed in the inner workings of the Fatimid court, studying under its top scholars and becoming a prominent figure within the Ismaili movement. But Hassan was no mere acolyte, his ambition was boundless. It was in Cairo that Hassan crossed paths with two other men who would shape his destiny, Nizam al-Mulk and Omar Khayyam. The three were said to have made a pact, an alliance based on their intellectual prowess and shared ambition. While Nizam al-Mulk would go on to become a powerful vizier under the Seljuk Empire, and Omar Khayyam would become renowned for his poetry and contributions to science, Hassan's path would lead him into the shadows. As Hassan rose through the ranks of the Fatimid hierarchy, his unwavering belief in his own version of the Ismaili faith put him at odds with those in power. The tension between Hassan and the Fatimid leadership grew to a breaking point, and soon, the once promising scholar found himself a marked man, forced into exile. Yet exile did not weaken Hassan, it emboldened him. He traveled across Persia, slowly building a network of followers who shared his vision, a radical sect of Ismailis who would break away from the Fatimids and create their own path, their own power. Hassan's journey led him to a place of both legend and terror, Alamut. High in the Elbers Mountains of northern Iran, Alamut stood like a jagged tooth in the sky, a fortress said to be impenetrable, unreachable except by the most dangerous and winding paths. It was here, in 1090, that Hassan i Saba made his boldest move. Through a combination of cunning, diplomacy and, according to some legends, sheer sorcery, 
Hassan seized control of the fortress without a single drop of blood being spilled. Some say he offered the current Lord of Alamut a fortune in gold. Others claim he mesmerized the Lord, convincing him that the fortress was fated to belong to Hassan. Whatever the truth, by the time the sun set on that fateful day, Alamut was in Hassan's hands. From this mountain citadel, Hassan would establish the Nazari Ismaili state, but more than that, he would lay the foundation for a secret order that would terrify rulers and armies for centuries, the assassins. Alamut became much more than a fortress. It was a sanctuary, a place where Hassan's followers could train, study, and prepare for their missions. Here, in the cold, silent halls of stone, Hassan perfected the art of indoctrination. He selected his most loyal devotees, men who believed without question in his cause, and transformed them into fidai, dedicated assassins willing to sacrifice their lives at his command. To these men, Hassan was not just a leader but a prophet, and his word was law. The strategy was as brilliant as it was terrifying. Rather than raise armies and wage open warfare against his enemies, who ranged from the Seljuk sultans to the Abbasid caliphs, Hassan deployed his assassins in the dead of night, striking fear into the hearts of even the most powerful rulers. One by one, his enemies fell, each death meticulously planned and executed with ruthless precision. The killings were never random, they were targeted, calculated to send a message. No one was safe. From Alamut, the assassins launched a campaign of terror that would spread far and wide. Hassan himself never left the fortress after its capture, but his influence extended across the Middle East. His agents moved in the shadows, blending into crowds, infiltrating courts, and waiting for the precise moment to strike. For years, the rulers of the region lived in fear, never knowing when the next blade would fall. And all of it, every killing, every whisper of terror, originated from the eagle's nest, high in the mountains, where Hassan I Saba sat in his stone fortress, watching, waiting, and pulling the strings of a deadly game that had only just begun. Alamut would become a symbol of fear, but also of resistance, a dark citadel where the cult of the assassins was born. The rise of Hassan I Saba and his fortress marked the beginning of a secret war, one fought not with armies but with stealth, manipulation, and the cold, sharp sting of a dagger in the night. Chapter 2 Ideology and Initiation Inside the Assassin's Order The fortress of Alamut stood like a brooding sentinel over the Persian landscape, its jagged walls and treacherous paths warding off those who dared approach. But it wasn't just the towering ramparts that instilled fear in the hearts of the region's most powerful rulers, it was the men inside. This was no ordinary stronghold, it was the birthplace of a fanatical sect, an army of shadowy killers bound by an unshakable creed. Here, Hassan I Saba presided over his secret order, a place where belief and death were intertwined, where ideology was weaponized and where the faithful became assassins. At the core of this sect was a doctrine that set them apart from every other Islamic faction, Nazari Ismailism. For the Nazaris, their faith was more than a set of prayers and rituals, it was a path to hidden knowledge, a gateway to divine truth that only the chosen could walk. While the broader Islamic world followed the teachings of the Quran and the Hadith, the Nazaris believed in something far more esoteric. They saw themselves as the enlightened few, led by an imam who could reveal the spiritual secrets hidden beneath the surface of religious texts. To the assassins, Hassan I Saba was not just a leader but a bridge to the divine, a figure through whom the true essence of Islam flowed. Their belief in the imam was central. For the Nazaris, the Imam was the rightful and divinely appointed spiritual leader, a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad through his cousin and son-in-law Ali. Unlike the Abbasid or Seljuk rulers who claimed authority through force, the Imam's authority was ordained by God himself. In this, the Nazaris diverged from the mainstream Ismailis, declaring their loyalty to Nazar, the son of the Fatimid Caliph Al-Mustansir, whom they believed to be the rightful Imam. For Hassan and his followers, Nazar's lineage represented the continuation of a divine chain that could not be broken. Anyone who opposed this was a heretic, and to challenge the imam was to challenge God's will, a crime punishable by death. But it wasn't just religious devotion that bound the assassins together. Hassan I Saba's brilliance lay in his ability to blend this mystical ideology, 
with a rigid and meticulously organized hierarchy. Alamut was not merely a fortress, it was a school of death where initiates were trained in the art of stealth, deception, and assassination. Within these cold stone walls, a sinister system of ranks and rituals turned common men into living weapons. At the pinnacle of this deadly pyramid was Hassan I. Saba himself, the Grand Master known to his followers as the Old Man of the Mountain. Remote, calculating, and feared even by those closest to him, Hassan rarely left his private quarters in the uppermost part of the fortress. He ruled through whispers, letters, and decrees, orchestrating death from a distance with chilling precision. Underneath him were his lieutenants, men who served as his eyes and ears across the Nazari network, each loyal to him without question. But the most important members of this deadly hierarchy were the Fidai, the devotees, those willing to sacrifice their lives at a single word from Hassan. The Fidai were no ordinary soldiers, they were hand-picked, chosen for their loyalty, intelligence and willingness to die for the cause. These men were trained to blend into their surroundings, infiltrating courts, armies and even homes, waiting patiently for the perfect moment to strike. To be a Fidai was to embrace death, to see it not as an end but as a glorious transition to the afterlife. The Fidai believed that their martyrdom would be rewarded in paradise, and Hassan made sure this belief was reinforced at every level. The indoctrination of the Fidai was as methodical as it was terrifying. Hassan's methods of control were a combination of psychological manipulation, religious fervor, and ritualistic training. The young men who arrived at Alamut were stripped of their former identities, isolated from the outside world, and immersed in the teachings of Nazari Ismailism. Their minds were filled with stories of the Imam's divine right, of the glories awaiting them in the afterlife, and of the honor that came with serving the Grand Master. Hassan's true genius, however, lay in his ability to turn belief into obedience. He cultivated an atmosphere of mysticism and fear, using a mixture of rewards and punishments to shape the minds of his recruits. Some say that Hassan even used drugs to control his men. It was whispered that he would give his followers hashish, leading them into a state of euphoria, before showing them a garden filled with unimaginable beauty, an artificial paradise where the Fidai would believe they had glimpsed heaven. When the effects wore off, Hassan would tell them that this paradise would be theirs if they died in service to him. Whether these tales are true or exaggerated by time, one fact remains, the Fidai would follow his orders without question even to their deaths. The initiation process was not only psychological, but physical. Each Fidai was trained in the arts of deception and stealth. They were taught to use disguises, to blend in with the crowds, to read the movements and habits of their targets. They practiced with knives, learning the precise places on the human body that would kill with a single strike. Silence was their ally, patience was their virtue. They were not trained for open battle but for assassination, swift, surgical, and lethal. Rituals bound them together, creating a sense of unity and brotherhood within the order. When a Fidai was assigned his first mission, it was not given casually. The Grand Master's orders came down through the hierarchy with solemnity and gravity, and the Fidai would prepare himself for what was not just a mission but a sacred act. Each assassination was seen as a blow struck in the name of the Imam, an act of divine justice against the enemies of truth. As the Fidai slipped into the night, they carried with them the weight of their faith and the certainty that if they were to die, they would do so in service of a higher cause. Failure was not an option. The consequences for disobedience or incompetence were swift and brutal. Hassan ruled with an iron fist, ensuring that loyalty was absolute and that those who faltered were dealt with harshly. The stories of executions within the ranks of the assassins spread fear, reinforcing the sense that once you joined the order there was no escape. The sect operated with an eerie efficiency, striking fear into the hearts of their enemies. Kings, viziers and sultans knew that even behind the thickest walls and within the largest armies, they were never safe. A single fidai with his blade hidden beneath his robes, could slip into any court, any tent, and deliver death. It was not their numbers that made the assassins dangerous, but their commitment, their unwavering belief that they were God's chosen executioners. In the shadowy halls of Alamut, 
Hassan I. Saba had created more than just a secret order. He had forged a weapon of belief, one that cut deeper than any sword, striking at the very soul of those it targeted. To face the assassins was to face not just a blade, but an idea, a belief so powerful that it could compel men to die with a smile on their lips, knowing they had earned their place in paradise. Chapter 3 The First Strike, Seljuk Targets It was the year 1092, and the shadow of death moved silently across the Seljuk Empire. In the height of its power, the Seljuk dynasty dominated vast territories, stretching from the edge of Anatolia to the borders of India. Its rulers held the Abbasid Caliphate under their thumb, and its armies were feared across the Islamic world. But no empire is immune to fear, no matter how mighty. And on one fateful day, that fear was unleashed by the assassins in a single, surgical strike that would ripple across the political landscape like a tremor before an earthquake. Nizam al-Mulk was the vizier of the Seljuk Empire, a man whose influence rivaled that of the Sultan himself. For nearly thirty years Nizam had been the true power behind the throne, a brilliant strategist and a cunning politician who controlled the empire's vast bureaucracy. His enemies whispered that without him, the empire would crumble. It was a sentiment not lost on Hassan i Saba, who saw Nizam not only as an enemy, but as the keystone holding together the Seljuks' vast and oppressive regime. The day of the assassination was like any other. Nizam al-Mulk, surrounded by his retinue, traveled along a quiet road, unaware that death stalked him from the shadows. Among his entourage was a man dressed as a humble dervish, a simple, unassuming figure who seemed too meek to pose any threat. Yet concealed beneath the folds of his robe was a blade, sharpened to a deadly point, waiting for its moment. As the procession moved, the man approached the vizier. No one suspected him. He was but another religious devotee, seeking a blessing or an audience with the powerful Nizam al-Mulk. The guards didn't raise an alarm, and Nizam himself, lost in thought, did not perceive the danger until it was too late. In one swift motion, the assassin revealed his dagger and plunged it deep into the vizier's chest. Nizam al-Mulk gasped, his life ebbing away as he crumpled to the ground, his blood staining the earth. His guards reacted too late, too shocked to comprehend how a man of such immense power could be struck down in broad daylight by a lone assassin. Panic spread through the camp, but the assassin was already dead, cut down by Nizam's guards, but not before his mission was accomplished. The assassination of Nizam al-Mulk was the assassin's first high-profile strike, and its impact was immediate and catastrophic. The vizier's death left the Seljuk court reeling, and with the loss of its most capable leader, the empire was plunged into disarray. The sultan, Malik Shah, who had relied heavily on Nizam's counsel, was shaken to his core. For years, the Seljuk rulers had believed themselves untouchable, ruling with iron fists and military might. But in a single stroke, Hassan i Saba and his followers had shown that no one, no matter how powerful, was beyond their reach. This assassination was not just a blow to the Seljuk military and political structure, it was a calculated act of psychological warfare. Nizam al-Mulk had been the glue holding the Seljuk empire together, and his death created a power vacuum that sent shockwaves through the ruling elite. Fear gripped the hearts of the Seljuk nobility. If a man as powerful and well-guarded as Nizam could be struck down, who among them was safe? The assassins did not need armies. They did not need vast resources. With one dagger, they had sown chaos and uncertainty. The methods employed by the assassins were as terrifying as they were effective. Unlike traditional warfare, which relied on brute force, the assassins wielded fear as their most potent weapon. Stealth, deception, and precision were their tools of the trade. Each assassination was meticulously planned, often months in advance with Hassan i Saba orchestrating every move from his fortress at Alamut. His fidai, the devoted assassins, were trained in the arts of disguise and infiltration, able to blend into the ranks of their enemies unnoticed until the moment they struck. Disguise became the assassins' signature method of operation. They would take on the personas of scholars, merchants, servants, or religious figures, patiently embedding themselves within enemy strongholds. Sometimes they would live among their targets for weeks or even months, 
gaining trust, gathering information, and waiting for the perfect moment to kill. When the time came, they struck with cold efficiency, disappearing into the night, or often, sacrificing themselves for the cause. For the Fidai, martyrdom was not something to be feared but embraced. They believed that dying in service to their Grand Master would guarantee them paradise, and this belief made them unstoppable. What made the assassins particularly terrifying was that their killings were never random. Each target was chosen with strategic care, selected for the political and psychological damage their death would cause. Hassan I. Saba did not merely seek revenge, he sought control through chaos. Every assassination was a message to the rulers of the Islamic world, no matter how high you sit, no matter how thick your walls or how many guards you employ, you are never safe. The doctrine behind these killings was chilling in its simplicity. Hassan's assassins didn't need to fight their enemies on the battlefield. Instead, they undermined them from within, creating an atmosphere of paranoia and fear that made ruling increasingly difficult. Sultans, viziers and commanders lived in constant dread, never knowing when or where the next strike would come. Rulers began to look suspiciously at their own servants and allies, fearing betrayal at every corner. This fear paralyzed entire governments, leaving them vulnerable to collapse or manipulation. As the legend of the assassins grew, so too did their power. It was said that to cross Hassan i Saba was to invite death. His reach extended far beyond the walls of Alamed, infiltrating the courts of the most powerful empires in the region. Leaders who once ruled with absolute authority now hesitated, knowing that a single assassin could end their lives in the blink of an eye. This was not just a tool of war, it was a form of control. The assassins became not only a deadly force, but also a political entity, wielding influence through the very fear they instilled. Hassan's strategy was brilliant in its brutality. He understood that fear, once planted, spreads like wildfire. The more notorious his order became, the easier it was to exert influence without lifting a finger. Soon, rulers and powerful men were sending gifts and tributes to Alamut, hoping to avoid becoming the next target. Some even sought to form alliances with the assassins, preferring to be in Hassan's good graces than face his wrath. The assassination of Nizam al-Mulk marked the dawn of a new kind of warfare, one fought not with armies but with shadows and whispers with daggers and dread. It was a war waged in the minds of men, and in this, Hassan i Saba was the undisputed master. His assassins moved unseen, their blades invisible until the moment they struck. And in their wake, they left only terror. Chapter 4 The Campaign of Fear Expansion of the Assassin Network By the time the shadow of the assassins spread beyond the walls of Alamet, the world had begun to tremble beneath the weight of their growing legend. From the jagged peaks of the Elbers Mountains, Hassan i Saba's reach extended far beyond Persia. His network of Fidai, trained to kill with silent precision, was expanding rapidly, and the mere mention of the assassins was enough to send chills down the spines of rulers and clerics alike. But their ambition did not stop at Persia's borders. The next target of their campaign of fear would be Syria, where a new stronghold would rise and the assassins would become even more deeply entwined with the region's political and religious conflicts. Syria, like Persia, was a land riddled with division. The Crusades had brought a new wave of instability, with Christian knights clashing against Muslim rulers, while the Seljuk Empire continued its reign of terror. It was into this tumultuous landscape that the assassins moved, quietly establishing themselves in a land where power could shift with a single stroke of a blade. Their goal was clear, to spread the influence of Nazari Ismailism and to continue their campaign against their enemies, whether they be Sunni rulers, crusaders, or anyone who threatened their existence. The most significant foothold in Syria came with the capture of Masayaf Castle, a fortress as impenetrable as Alamut itself. Perched on a rocky hilltop, Masayaf was the perfect base for the assassins to launch their operations throughout the Levant. From this eerie stronghold, the assassins could strike with terrifying precision, controlling the valleys and passes that led to the Crusader states, the Seljuk territories, and even the heart of the Fatimid Empire. The fortress of Masayaf quickly became shrouded in legend, much like Alamut. 
The inhabitants of nearby villages whispered of its mysterious inhabitants, men who could slip into any fortress, kill with a single blow, and disappear without a trace. Even the castle itself seemed to possess an aura of dread. Its high walls and narrow pathways were said to be haunted by the ghosts of those who had crossed the assassins and paid the ultimate price. As the assassin network spread, so too did their list of victims. The order's reach extended not only into Persia and Syria, but into the very heart of the Islamic and Crusader worlds. Among the assassins' most notorious killings was the assassination of Conrad of Montferrat, a powerful crusader who was on the verge of becoming the king of Jerusalem. In 1192, as Conrad walked through the streets of Tyre, two fidi approached him, disguised as monks. They greeted him with reverence, and before anyone could react, they plunged their daggers into his chest. The streets were soon filled with the sound of Conrad's dying breaths as his blood stained the cobblestones. This assassination sent shockwaves through the Crusader states, a stark reminder that no one, not even Christian kings, was safe from the assassin's reach. The killing of Conrad was a political move, meant to destabilize the Crusader kingdom at a crucial moment, ensuring that power remained fragmented and that no one ruler could unite the Christian armies against the assassins or their Muslim allies. In another chilling strike, the assassins targeted Raymond II of Tripoli, a powerful Christian ruler who had crossed the order. Like Conrad, Raymond was cut down by a pair of fidi, who infiltrated his court and struck with cold precision. His death further fragmented the crusader forces in Syria, leaving them vulnerable to both internal strife and the growing influence of the assassins. But it wasn't just crusader kings who fell to the assassins' blades. Muslim leaders, too, were targeted if they posed a threat to the Nazari Ismaili cause. Far al-Mulk, a powerful Abbasid caliph and one of the Seljuk's most trusted viziers, was among the many high-profile figures to meet a brutal end at the hands of the assassins. Far al-Mulk had long been an enemy of the Ismailis, using his political power to suppress their movement. But the assassins had learned patience from their master, Hassan i Saba, and when the time came, they struck him down with chilling precision. Each assassination served a dual purpose, it eliminated a dangerous enemy, and spread fear like wildfire through the ranks of those who remained. No one knew when or where the next attack would come, and this uncertainty was as powerful as the blade itself. With each successful killing, the assassins' reputation grew, not just among their enemies but in the public consciousness. Rumors and myths began to swirl around them, giving rise to a mystique that was as much a part of their power as their knives. Tales of the assassins' supernatural abilities began to spread, some said they could walk through walls, others claimed they could hypnotize their victims, making them docile before the killing blow. There were even whispers that Hassan i Saba, though long dead, still commanded his followers from beyond the grave, his ghost watching over them from the heights of Alamut. The reality, of course, was far more grounded, but no less terrifying. The assassins were not supernatural beings, they were men, trained to the peak of human capability, who had mastered the arts of stealth, disguise, and murder. Yet the exaggerated tales only served to amplify their power. The more fantastical the stories, the more their enemies feared them, and this fear gave the assassins the upper hand in every conflict. Leaders began to take extreme precautions to avoid becoming the next target. Sultanates and crusader states alike employed food tasters, surrounded themselves with personal guards and built elaborate fortifications around their sleeping quarters. But deep down, they knew that if the assassins wanted them dead, no guard or fortress would be enough to stop them. Even the most powerful rulers, like Saladin, the legendary Muslim general, feared the reach of the assassins. In 1176, Saladin himself became a target after he attempted to crush the Ismailis in Syria. Two separate assassination attempts were made on his life, and although Saladin survived both, the incidents left him deeply shaken. He realized that the assassins were a force to be reckoned with, and he chose to negotiate rather than risk further attempts on his life. The assassins had, in effect, weaponized fear. They did not need armies to win battles. A single blade, well placed, could shift the balance of power in entire regions. Their enemies knew that no matter how secure they felt, no matter how many walls they built or soldiers they employed, 
the assassins could always find a way in. And so, with each strike, their legend grew, casting a long shadow over the Middle East. The assassins became more than just a sect, they became an idea, a specter that haunted the thoughts of kings and emperors. The mere suggestion that an assassin could be lurking in the shadows was often enough to alter political decisions and strategies. Their campaign of fear had succeeded in making them one of the most powerful and feared forces in the region. From the desolate halls of Alamet and Masayaf, Hassan I. Saba's legacy continued to echo through the centuries, a reminder that death, when wielded with precision and purpose, could reshape the very world itself. The assassins had become not just a tool of war, but a force of nature, and their story was far from over. Chapter 5 Enemies on All Sides, the Crusades and Beyond The 12th century was an age of chaos, war, and treachery. The Crusades had turned the Middle East into a battlefield where cultures, faiths, and empires clashed in a bloody struggle for dominance. Amid the frenzied violence of Christian and Muslim forces, one group played both sides of the deadly game with chilling precision, the assassins. While they were nominally enemies of the Crusader states, due to religious differences, the assassins had never been bound by conventional allegiances. They were guided by something far more pragmatic, survival and power. And if that meant forming alliances with their supposed enemies, they would do so without hesitation. The relationship between the assassins and the crusaders was complex, shifting between hostility and uneasy cooperation, depending on the political landscape of the time. To the Christian knights, the assassins were little more than shadowy heretics, dangerous zealots who worshipped strange gods and killed without mercy. Yet there were times when the goals of the assassins aligned with those of the crusaders, and in these moments alliances, though fragile, were formed. The crusader states were constantly embroiled in political intrigue and power struggles, not only with Muslim forces but among themselves. This chaos provided fertile ground for the assassins to maneuver. While the Christians viewed them with suspicion, they also recognized the usefulness of an ally who could kill without the need for open warfare. For the assassins, alliances with the crusaders were purely tactical, a way to eliminate mutual enemies or protect their interests from larger, more powerful foes like the Seljuks and the Fatimid Caliphate. One of the most famous instances of such an alliance came during the reign of King Amalrek I of Jerusalem. The assassins, threatened by their Muslim rivals, found it advantageous to strike a truce with Amalric. Though they had no love for the Christian invaders, they saw in Amalric a temporary shield against their enemies. The assassins, after all, understood that survival often required bending the rules. Thus, the dagger that could strike down a Muslim leader could just as easily be turned against a crusader enemy, whichever benefited their cause at the time. But the alliances were always tenuous. The assassins were not to be trusted, and the crusaders knew this. Any agreement with them was marked by a shadow of paranoia, as if at any moment a hidden blade might emerge from the folds of an assassin's robe. Fear and distrust lingered, but in the swirling chaos of the crusades, pragmatism often outweighed ideology. While the assassins could ally with crusaders when it suited them, there was one figure they could not ignore or manipulate, Saladin. By the late 12th century, the legendary Muslim general had become one of the most powerful forces in the Middle East, uniting large portions of the Muslim world under his banner and striking fear into both the Crusaders and the assassins alike. Saladin's rise threatened the very existence of the assassin order, and for that he became a prime target. The assassination attempt on Saladin was one of the most daring and ambitious missions the assassins had ever undertaken. It was the year 1176, and Saladin had already proven himself a formidable leader, one capable of uniting Muslim factions and mounting devastating campaigns against the Crusaders. His military prowess, combined with his growing influence, made him an existential threat to the assassins. If Saladin succeeded in consolidating his power, the assassins would be crushed beneath the weight of his armies. Under the cover of darkness, a group of Fidai infiltrated Saladin's camp. These men, trained to kill without hesitation, had been given the ultimate mission, eliminate the man who threatened their very survival. Disguised as Saladin's guards, they crept through the camp, 
their daggers gleaming in the moonlight, ready to strike. But Saladin, a seasoned commander who had long feared the assassin's reach, had fortified his defenses. The assassins made it deep into Saladin's personal quarters, a testament to their skill and resolve. But as one of the Fidai raised his blade, ready to plunge it into the heart of the sleeping general, Saladin's guards sprang into action. The assassin was cut down mere moments before he could deliver the killing blow. The others were hunted down and killed as they tried to escape, their bodies left as a grim warning to anyone who might try again. The failed assassination attempt enraged Saladin. It was more than just a threat to his life, it was a challenge to his authority. Saladin could not tolerate the existence of a group that wielded such unchecked power through fear and deception. In response, he launched a brutal campaign against the assassins, determined to wipe them from the face of the earth. Saladin marched on the assassins' Syrian strongholds, determined to crush them once and for all. He besieged Masayaf Castle, the heart of the assassin operations in the region, with his mighty army. But as Saladin's forces encircled the fortress, something strange happened, he withdrew. Some accounts suggest that Saladin received a message from the assassins, warning him that they could strike him down at any moment, even within the safety of his own camp. Other legends claim that one night, Saladin awoke to find an assassin standing over him, holding a poisoned dagger as a warning, then disappearing into the darkness without a trace. Whether these stories are fact or fiction, one thing is certain. Saladin pulled back from Masayaf, and the assassins lived to fight another day. Though the assassins survived Saladin's wrath, their world was becoming increasingly dangerous. The number of enemies surrounding them continued to grow, and while they could fend off isolated threats, the walls were slowly closing in. The Abbasid Caliphate remained a constant enemy, regarding the assassins as dangerous heretics. The Seljuks, though weakened by infighting, still posed a threat to the assassins' territories in Persia. But the greatest danger was yet to come. In the 13th century, a new force swept across the horizon, one more terrifying than anything the assassins had ever faced, the Mongols. Under the leadership of Genghis Khan and his successors, the Mongols unleashed a wave of devastation that would engulf the Middle East. Their armies were unlike anything the region had seen, unstoppable, ruthless, and utterly relentless. The Mongols cared little for the intricate web of political alliances and religious doctrines that had governed the Middle East for centuries. Their goal was simple, total domination. When the Mongols turned their attention to Persia, the assassins knew that their very existence was at stake. No amount of stealth or assassination could stop the Mongol horde. The assassins had always relied on fear to control their enemies, but the Mongols were immune to such tactics. The assassins' fortresses, once impregnable, were no match for the sheer brutality and numbers of the Mongol forces. As the Mongols stormed through Persia, fortress after fortress fell. Alamet, the heart of the assassins' power, would eventually be destroyed in 1256, signaling the end of their reign of terror. The assassin order, which had thrived in the shadows for centuries, was facing extinction. The Mongols, with their scorched earth tactics, showed no mercy. The world of the assassins, which had once seemed invincible, was crumbling under the weight of these new, unstoppable enemies. And so, surrounded on all sides by enemies old and new, the assassins were forced into a desperate fight for survival. Their time was running out, and soon the dark shadow they had cast over the Middle East for centuries would begin to fade. Chapter 6 The Fall of the Eagle's Nest By the mid-13th century, the sky over Persia darkened with the approach of an unstoppable force. The Mongols, led by the ruthless Hulagu Khan, swept across the vast, arid lands like a plague. Their reputation as merciless conquerors preceded them, leaving whole cities in ruin, their streets soaked with the blood of the innocent. Where the Mongols went, death followed. And now their gaze turned toward the one place that had remained unconquerable for nearly two centuries, the mountain fortress of Alamut, the legendary stronghold of the assassins. The rise of the Mongol Empire was unlike anything the world had seen. Under Genghis Khan, the Mongols had forged an empire that stretched from the steppes of Mongolia to the gates of Europe. They were a storm that crushed entire civilizations beneath their hooves, using a mix of brute force, 
terror, and unparalleled military strategy. But it wasn't just their sheer numbers that made them terrifying, it was their cold, calculated efficiency. The Mongols didn't just defeat their enemies, they annihilated them, reducing cities to ash and entire populations to dust. No one could stand against them, and those who tried met swift and brutal ends. By 1256, Hulagu Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, had been tasked with extending Mongol domination into the Middle East. Persia was already falling under Mongol control, its cities succumbing to siege after siege. Hulagu's mission was to eradicate any remaining resistance in the region, and among his primary targets were the Ismaili assassins, whose network of fortresses dotted the rugged mountains of northern Persia. The assassins, who had terrorized rulers and empires for over a century, were now facing a threat unlike any they had encountered before. Their blades and secret killings could not halt the oncoming Mongol horde. The fear that had served them so well over the years was useless against an enemy who knew no fear. Hulagu's forces moved with terrifying speed, toppling one assassin fortress after another, until all that remained was the great eagle's nest, Alamed. Perched high in the Elbers Mountains, Alamed had long been a symbol of invincibility. The fortress, known for its steep treacherous approaches and impenetrable walls, had weathered countless attacks over the years. From its stone ramparts, the assassins had struck fear into the hearts of kings and emperors, orchestrating murders and assassinations with ruthless precision. But now, the fortress stood at the mercy of the Mongol army, a storm of iron and blood that had already raised much of Persia. In 1256, Hulagu Khan laid siege to Alamut, surrounding it with his vast, brutal army. The Mongols were masters of siege warfare, and they came prepared to dismantle the mighty fortress stone by stone. The assassins, led by their last grand master, Rukan al-Din, knew that they were facing their darkest hour. The internal unity that had once been the strength of the order had begun to crumble. The years of fear and isolation had taken their toll. Some within the fortress believed they could negotiate with Hulagu, while others knew that the Mongols offered no mercy. As the Mongols closed in, the assassins desperately tried to defend their mountain citadel. But the might of the Mongol army was overwhelming. Siege engines pounded the walls of Alamut, while Mongol archers rained arrows down upon the defenders. Inside the fortress, the mood was grim. Rukan al Din, once a confident leader of the order, now faced internal dissent. Some of his commanders questioned his ability to lead, while others saw no hope of survival. The unity that had once bound the assassins was fracturing under the pressure of the Mongol onslaught. The siege dragged on, but the outcome was inevitable. The Mongols were relentless, their discipline unmatched. They cut off Alamut from any outside support, ensuring that no one could escape and no supplies could enter. Slowly but surely, the great fortress that had once been the seat of assassin power began to fall. When the Mongols finally breached the walls of Alamut, it was not with a roar of battle, but with a cold, methodical precision. Hulagu Khan, ever the strategist, did not seek to raise the fortress immediately. Instead, he demanded the surrender of Rukan al-Din, offering the Grand Master a chance to save his life if he complied. Facing the reality that his forces could no longer hold out, Rukan al-Din capitulated, turning over Alamet to the Mongols in the hopes of sparing what remained of his people. But Hulagu was not a man to show mercy. After taking control of the fortress, he dismantled its defenses and ordered the systematic destruction of Alamut's treasures and records, erasing centuries of assassin history. The fortress that had stood as a symbol of fear for so long was reduced to rubble. Its libraries, said to contain vast knowledge and secrets, were burned. The assassins who had survived the siege were either executed or enslaved, their fabled reign of terror coming to an abrupt and bloody end. The fall of Alamut marked the beginning of the end for the assassin order. With their central stronghold destroyed and their Grand Master in Mongol custody, the once fearsome sect was now little more than a shadow of its former self. Rukan al-Din, the last leader of the assassins, was taken prisoner by Hulagu Khan. Despite his attempts to negotiate for his life, he was ultimately executed, his head sent as a trophy to the Mongol court. With the death of Rukan al-Din, 
the assassins lost not only their leader but the last vestige of their unity and power. The order, once feared across the Middle East, was shattered. The Mongols continued their campaign of destruction, rooting out remaining assassin strongholds and executing their members with merciless efficiency. The sect that had thrived on fear and secrecy could not withstand the brute force and relentless pursuit of the Mongol war machine. For centuries, the assassins had wielded fear as their greatest weapon, striking from the shadows and manipulating the political landscape with surgical precision. But in the end, they faced an enemy that fear could not touch. The Mongols did not cower before the threat of assassination or the whispered tales of death from the shadows. They met the assassins' terror with a terror of their own, one that came on horseback clad in armor with swords and fire. As Alamut crumbled and the assassin order disintegrated, an era came to a close. The once dreaded assassins, who had held sultans and kings in their grip, were no more. The reign of terror that had lasted for nearly 200 years was extinguished in a single campaign. The mountain strongholds that had been the source of their power lay in ruins, their people scattered or dead. And in the ashes of Alamut, the legend of the assassins faded, swallowed by the sands of time and the relentless march of the Mongol Empire. But even in their defeat, the assassins left behind a legacy that would live on in whispers and legends, a shadow that would continue to haunt the pages of history. Their methods, their ideology, and their deadly precision would inspire fear for centuries to come, long after the last blade had been sheathed. Chapter 7 Legacy of the Assassins the name of the assassins has long been cloaked in myth and shadow, lingering at the edge of historical memory like a dark specter. For centuries their reputation has been exaggerated, distorted and reshaped, turning them into figures of terror both real and imagined. From medieval chroniclers to modern pop culture, the assassins have taken on a life of their own, their deeds immortalized in whispers of dread. Yet beneath the layers of legend lies a deeper truth, a history both horrifying and fascinating, where fact and fiction intertwine like a dagger hidden in the folds of a cloak. Myth versus Reality The true history of the assassins, born from the Nazari Ismaili sect under the guidance of Hassan i Saba, is one of cunning, terror and survival. They were not a vast army or an empire, but a small tightly organized group who wielded fear like a weapon. From the shadows of Alamut, their operatives, the Fidai, carried out precise and terrifying assassinations that shook the very foundations of power across the Middle East. They were not bound by the rules of conventional warfare, and their strikes were as much psychological as they were physical. Yet, from the very beginning, their mystique grew beyond their actual deeds. Medieval chroniclers, especially those from Europe and the Crusader states, found the assassins to be a compelling and terrifying subject. In their writings, the assassins became larger than life, their prowess exaggerated into near-mythical proportions. Some accounts claimed that the assassins were drugged with hashish before being sent on their deadly missions, giving rise to the word hashishin, from which the term assassin is derived. These tales, while rooted in some truths, were often embellished, creating an image of the assassins as supernatural killers, capable of striking fear into even the most secure palaces and fortresses. The legends surrounding the assassins took on new dimensions with the passage of time. The more their influence spread, the more their reputation grew, until they became synonymous with stealth, secrecy, and unrelenting terror. Their real-life tactics, disguises, infiltration, and targeted killings were terrifying enough, but the legends turned them into something almost otherworldly. It was said that the assassins could strike anyone, anywhere, without warning, and without fear of death. Kings, sultans, and even popes were said to tremble at the thought of these shadowy killers lurking in the dark. In modern times, the assassins have been romanticized in books, films, and video games. The most famous of these is the Assassin's Creed franchise, which took the historical seeds of the Assassin Order and wove them into a complex narrative involving secret societies, ancient artifacts, and a millennia-spanning conspiracy. While the games are far from historically accurate, they serve as a testament to the enduring fascination with the assassins and their mysterious legacy. The image of the hooded killer, moving silently through crowds and eliminating targets with surgical precision, 
continues to captivate audiences worldwide. Yet, while the myths have persisted, the reality of the assassins was much more grounded, and far more sinister. They were not motivated by greed or power for its own sake, but by a fierce loyalty to their beliefs and their imam. Their actions were calculated, their methods cold and efficient. They were not driven by madness, but by ideology. And it is this ideological commitment, perhaps more than anything else, that has left the most lasting mark on history. Influence on Modern Terrorism The tactics and ideologies of the assassins have echoed through the centuries, influencing the way modern terrorist groups operate. The concept of martyrdom, so central to the assassin creed, has been adopted and amplified by numerous groups in the modern era. Just as the Fidai willingly gave their lives for the cause, believing in the promise of eternal paradise, so too do modern extremists embrace the idea of self-sacrifice in pursuit of ideological goals. The assassins pioneered the use of targeted killings as a means of political influence, a method that has been mirrored by contemporary terrorist organizations. Today, suicide bombers and lone wolf attackers operate with a similar mindset, seeking to destabilize governments and spread fear through the elimination of key figures. Just as the assassins carefully chose their targets, whether they be sultans, viziers, or crusader kings, modern groups identify high-profile targets whose deaths can create the greatest shockwaves. While the assassins operated within a specific religious and political context, their methods transcended time and geography. The idea that a small, committed group can wield disproportionate power through fear and strategic violence is one that continues to resonate today. The assassins may no longer exist in their original form, but their tactics, born from necessity and fanaticism, live on in the strategies of modern insurgent and extremist movements. Their ability to inspire fear, even in the most fortified of places, remains a chilling legacy that has shaped the world of clandestine warfare and terrorism. The Nazari Ismailis Today Yet the story of the Nazari Ismailis did not end with the fall of Alamut and the demise of the assassin order. Over the centuries, the Nazari Ismaili community has undergone a profound transformation, distancing itself from its violent past and emerging as a global community known for its contributions to peace, education, and philanthropy. Under the guidance of the Aga Khan, the current spiritual leader of the Nazari Ismailis, the community has flourished, embodying values that stand in stark contrast to the bloody legacy of the assassins. The Aga Khan, whose lineage traces back to the imams revered by the assassins, has worked tirelessly to promote social development, cultural preservation and humanitarian aid across the world. The Aga Khan Development Network, AKDN, one of the largest private development agencies in the world, has made significant strides in improving the quality of life for people in some of the most impoverished and conflict-ridden regions. From building schools and hospitals, to supporting cultural projects that preserve history and heritage, the AKDN is a testament to the positive impact that the Nazari Ismaili community has made in the modern era. In many ways, the Nazari Ismailis of today are the antithesis of the assassins of old. Where the assassins operated in secrecy, spreading fear and death, the modern Nazari Ismaili community is open, peaceful, and focused on building bridges between cultures. Where the assassins used violence as a means to an end, the Aga Khan emphasizes dialogue, education, and humanitarianism as tools for creating a more just and compassionate world. This transformation, from a sect known for its shadowy assassins to a global community committed to the betterment of humanity, is a remarkable testament to the power of evolution within religious and cultural traditions. The assassins, though long gone, remain a haunting chapter in the history of the Nazari Ismailis, but their legacy today is one of peace and progress. The story of the assassins is one of darkness and light, of terror and transcendence. Though their reign of fear ended centuries ago, their shadow continues to loom large over the pages of history, a reminder of the power that lies in belief, loyalty, and the thin line between myth and reality.